This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today we're joined by a man who isn't afraid to share the gospel with others. Greg Steyer is founder of Dare to Share, the worldwide ministry that helps equip young people to engage others in discussions about the gospel. You may be surprised that Greg didn't grow up in a Christian family, but through one man sharing the gospel with his father would change the direction of his life. Hey, that's, that's quite a, I mean, looking at you and then looking at the, the, the title of the book, I think, nah, you never went through any of that. You look, you look like you're in pretty good shape. You didn't put up <laughs> a lot of street stuff. What, I mean, this, this book, I, I, I've read sections of it, They're just trying to get it on, on the internet. I don't have it right in here in front of me right now, but uh, uh, it, it is, uh, it's a tough way to be raised, and you don't think of Denver as the mean streets of America. Well, tell me about the yeah. early early childhood. Well, you know, every city's got a city, Bob. I mean, it, you know, it, there's inner city Columbus, there's inner city Lincoln, Nebraska, there's yeah. inner city New York, South Chicago. You got East St. Louis, and you got North Denver. In the seventies and sixties, it was uh, it was the highest crime rate area in Denver, and those streets were ruled at the time by a mafia family called the Small Domes. Mm -hmm. And the Small Domes nicknamed my uncles the Crazy Brothers. So <laughs> and my family was not organized crime. They were disorganized crime. And uh, they were violent. Three of my uncles were competitive bodybuilders. The fourth one um, was a bouncer at the toughest bar in Denver. The fifth one was a Golden Gloves boxer, judo champion, war hero. My mom was the only girl in the group, and they were all afraid of her. She, she used a baseball bat. And my family was extremely violent wow. and they lived for violence. They worked out for maximum, you know, power so they could, when they hit somebody, it rattled their ancestors. So it was a, it was a really <laughs> violent family. I was yeah, I, I, I read here one of these notes. Uh, says some, some memories are permanently seared into our childhood brains with a hot iron of adrenaline and fear. For five-year-old Greg, it was a memory of his ma walking back to the house after confronting his stepdad with a splintered, bloodied baseball bat in her hand. That's a memory that won't leave you. Well, yeah, I was five years old. I was playing on the front porch, and here comes Paul, one of the guys my mom had married who had left us. We had no idea where he was. Pulls up in a brand-new car. I yelled inside, Mommy, Mommy, one of my daddies is here. And she looked out the window. She was doing the dishes, cigarette hanging out of her mouth, dropped a couple F-bombs, reached behind the door, grabbed the baseball bat, ran out. Cigarette still in her mouth, shattered his front windshield, took out his headlights, <laughs> took off his side view mirror, started doing body damage and just taunting him, get out of the car. And, you know, she's got five street fighting brothers that are afraid of her. She's not afraid of this dude. He gets out. He makes a tactical mistake. <laughs> and she lit him up. And I remember Bob thinking three things when she walked back up. One, I will never disobey my mommy again, <laughs> yeah. you know. Two, how did that how did that cigarette stay in her mouth the whole time? And three, why is my ma so mad? Yeah. And she had a I found out years later, she had a shame fueled rage that was always pent up and ready to explode. And um well, did, she was a wild child. Did that, that, that shame, did that, that emanate from her family background, something that, uh, that she grew up with, something that she did that she was still ashamed of? Where'd that, where yeah. that, that rage come from? It came from a lot of things. One of the things, I think one of the biggest was uh, <clears throat> when um, in 1965, she met a guy named Tony at a party. They partied. Mm -hmm. She got pregnant. He found out he was in the Army. He got transferred. Uh, she got in her car, drove from Denver to Boston to have an illegal abortion. Uh, and um, she stayed with my uncle Tommy and Aunt Carol, who were believers. He was stationed uh, in Boston in the Navy. They actually talked her out of it over a couple months. And so she came back, uh, had that baby, and uh, I was that baby. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she, every time she looked at me, uh, a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times she looked at me, she'd burst into tears because she was so... She felt so guilty for almost aborting me. And um, so there was a lot of shame. And it wasn't just me, but a lot of stuff that yeah. she had done and mm -hmm. that she never thought God could forgive her for. So were, were you, you, are you an only child? Do you have siblings? I have an older brother. Okay. So Doug was seven years older than me. Oh, and, seven um, years older. So was, yeah. he, was, was he any influence in your life at all growing up? Yeah, well, he was my protector. 
in the you know in our area with again we lived in the highest crime rate area of our city and so he he protected me but my brother you know what happened i'll just kind of back it up because you Mm -hmm. need to understand the big picture my family's in this downward spiral and a hillbilly preacher whose nickname for whatever reason was yankee (laughs) of course why not why not planted a church in the suburbs of denver and on a dare from a guy named Bob Daly, who was a believer who knew my family. My mm-hmm. family's last name was Matthias. And uh, he he dared Yankee to share the gospel with my toughest uncle, my Uncle Jack. My Uncle Jack, you know, was a bodybuilder, was a street fighter. Uh, Lyle Alzado backed out of two arm wrestling matches with him because Whoa. My, my, if you remember that, Lyle that, Alzado. Yeah, I, I do. That's, yeah. Football. He was afraid of my Uncle Jack. <laughs> And, uh, you know, my uncle Jack in and out of jail his whole life one time for choking two cops unconscious at the same time who are trying to arrest him on assault charges. Very dangerous man. Yankee goes to his door, knocks on his door. Jack comes to the door, no shirt on, tats everywhere, two beer cans, one for drinking beer, one for spit and chew. Talk like this. He goes, what do you want? And Yankee said, I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. He goes, well, I don't know Jesus. I know Bob. I'll give you five minutes. Invites him in. He sits at the kitchen table, and Yankee explains the gospel, wow. not religion, but that Jesus came for sinners, that salvation wasn't by being good, that we're all sinners headed to hell, that Christ died in our place for our sin, that he rose from the dead, and that everyone who simply trusts in him has eternal life. And uh, Yankee asked my Uncle Jack, does that make sense? My Uncle Jack didn't know any better. He goes, hell yeah. That was a sinner's prayer was, hell yeah. <laughs> he trusted in Jesus, and it began a domino effect yeah. in my whole family. That, I mean, that's, did, was that an immediate turnaround, or did Yankee continue to disciple him, or did, did Jack just decide, I'm going to be this Christian? I mean, how, how immediate was that? Well, it was immediate. I mean, he brought 250 people out to Yankee's church in one month. 250, I mean, think oh, about that, one wow. month. 250 That's bodybuilders, street church. fighters, gang members. My Uncle Jack, once he got a hold of the good news, is like, I got to tell everybody. Now, he was still rough. Yeah. You know, he's in the book, Unlikely Fighter. There's a there's a scene where he is in a sauna as a brand new believer. And when you're in a sauna, you know, you have no clothes on. He's sharing Christ with another buck naked bodybuilder. And there's a third guy from a different religion who's trying to argue and interrupts my Uncle Jack. And my Uncle Jack doesn't know the rules about loving your enemies. He goes, hey, you interrupt me again. I'm taking you out. He continues to share Christ. The guy interrupts again. Boom, he hits this guy. The guy fell down, looked up and goes, Jesus didn't go around hitting people like that. He goes, well, I ain't Jesus. I'm Jack. <laughs> and so it took a while for sanctification to kick in. Yeah. But Sanctification is a process, right? a process um, but, but you know he man it, i remember when he came to christ it jolted it's it was a gospel tsunami uh, that hit yeah. his life and hit my family what age were you when jack first came to christ when this started i don't exactly remember i think it was like four or five when jack when i when jack came to christ now when jack uh when jack received christ and he went to yankee's church did did, did he take you along at that point i mean is that how you made the connection with yankee so all this stuff is kind of happening you know within months or years of each other and a few years and i'm you know my life is being transformed in the process so it, it was a it's a wild story and um but you know when you're a kid raised in it it's you know, you just think it's this life. is normal. Yeah, it's normal life. It's life. You, know? you see, you see the dominoes start to fall, and uh, yeah, uh, one after another. And, and Yankees Church had mentioned that uh, uh, eight hundred kids in a, in a yeah. church with an adult membership of three hundred. He really believed the fastest way to reach a city was through the young people, and he was right. The city of Arvada, which is a suburb in Denver, was shaken through one youth group that and that's when i i started going to yankees uh youth group when i was a you know young teenager and that's when i learned how to share my faith that's when i got a vision to to reach the lost that's when i learned how to preach that's when i I mean i mean all that stuff happened when i was a uh at yankees youth group because he believed in the power of the gospel and the potential of young people was he leading all that directly or do you have he have other other youth leaders involved in that that were discipling people like yourself Oh, he had, he had, the leaders of the group were older teenagers that had been saved through the youth group that he had trained and equipped and mobilized. 
And uh, a lot so of just, Latino, repli just replicating itself. Yeah, and a lot of Latinos from West Denver and North Denver, and uh, they were they were the my hands on youth leaders that were training and equipping us. And the first person on my mind, Bob, to to share Christ with was my mom. Okay. So when I was trained and equipped, I went back when I was like eleven or twelve and started sharing Christ with my mom. My mom would be sitting there like, "You don't know the things I've done wrong," and I knew them all because my grandma had told me yeah. everything. So she was, you know? she was, she was kind of putting it off because of, she felt guilt, not because she she didn't want Christ in her life, but it was it was because she didn't, the think, because she didn't the shame. think God loved her. Yeah, she yeah. just I've done too many things wrong, and so finally, after three years of sharing Christ, fifteen, I walked into the kitchen. You kind of got to come at my family. I set her ma down. I go, "Hey, ma, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm tired of you living through this hell." I want you to listen to every word coming out of my mouth. And I didn't talk like that to my mom because I didn't want to get slapped. You didn't want to get hit with a baseball but bat. She, yeah, <laughs> she listened. And uh, she's smoking a cigarette. She goes, you mean to tell me that Jesus died for all my sins? I go, yeah. She goes, she took a drag. She goes, you mean to tell me all I got to do is put my faith in Jesus and I'm saved for everything forgiven? Go, yeah. You give an eternal life. Get a new family. Wow. Family of God. She took a drag. She goes, I'm in. She put her faith in Christ while smoking a cigarette. And then I asked her, where are you going to go when you die? She goes, heaven, cigarettes and all. I go, ma, heaven's not smoking. <laughs> but yeah, you are going there. And the, the, the last part of your book, you, you, you deal, deal with your mother while she's in hospice. Do you want to share any of that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a poignant yeah. story. Oh, it was our, you know, I mean, the book is 22 chapters mm -hmm. long, unlikely fighter, 22 chapters long. The first 21 happened before I turned 16. Yeah. The last one happened 17 years ago while my mom's in hospice for 40 days and 40 nights. Oh. And so the family, you know, is all gathering, recounting stories of how our lives have been changed over the years and how much God had done. And so it's really kind of a catch up chapter mm -hmm. of, you know, the, the power of the gospel. And, uh, you know, I just encourage listeners, don't underestimate the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have a lot of stuff going on in this country, a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. The gospel changes everything 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 so don't underestimate that gospel message and don't give up on reaching that one last person god's putting on your heart well you've taken all of that and all that energy that came as, as in your childhood and you've you've developed it into a, into a ministry dare to share you started this back in the in what 1990 somewhere around there. yeah it's actually yes yeah, 30 30 uh, years old well now. you can't, it can't be you're not that old yeah i am that old <laughs> i'm 56. wow uh, but uh, dare, to, dare to share. Tell me about that, because you really believe that, that uh, the gospel can be effectively taken to the world through teenagers. Yeah, I saw it modeled as a kid growing up in Yankee's church, you know, that what Yankee did to shake a city, we can do to shake, a, shake the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 300,000 Protestant churches in America. There's 5 million or so worldwide. And so we live to energize the church, to mobilize youth, to gospelize their world. And so we, we provide tools, resources, training, equipping, okay. and mobilize teens. Well, we want to we talk about that some more, but we're going to take a break right now. When we come back, we'll talk more about Dare to Share. We'll be right back. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Placey. This is where on other programs, you'd be watching a commercial, but not on Viewpoint. If you've never supported TV44 before and enjoy Bob's interviews on Viewpoint, we encourage you to please support us today. Go to WTLW.com and click Donate. Cancel culture has become one of the leading threats to evangelical Christians. Greg Steyer founded the organization Dare to Share, and he believes while cancel culture remains a threat, it can also be a great motivator for us to share the gospel with others. That ministry, how did that, uh, did that come out of your time at, at Yankees Church? Did it come out of your time afterwards? Were you educated to do this, or this is something that came 
just through the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, both. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Yankee just believes so much in teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I saw that growing up, the, the power of the gospel and the potential of young people. Uh, teens come to Christ faster and can spread the gospel farther than adults. And uh, so that was in my DNA. And that the Holy Spirit definitely put it in my heart to start Dare to Share. And so we started Dare to Share in 91 and, um, you know, doing small little events and trainings. And, you know, since then, we've been able to train millions of teenagers mm -hmm across America and now around the world, how to share the gospel. If you look at uh, George Barna, we interviewed him last year, and George was saying, you know, there's, there's less teenagers in church. They're not coming back. It's not that circle where they, they go to Sunday school, leave when they're in college, and come back after they get mm -hmm. married. That circle's not being completed now. Less and less teenagers in church. Uh, are, is it, what have you seen in that, in that 30 some years? Are churches less focused on teens or has the culture, are we, we, we culturally inept compared to the rest of the culture? Well, I mean, it's a, Barna calls this the first post-Christian generation in mm -hmm. the history of the United States, Generation Z, this current generation yeah. of teenagers. And, you know, I, I think they're just, the, the stuff that we did in the 80s isn't working. The come and see, you know, come to mm -hmm. our big, cool youth group. It's just not working like it, like it was back then. So I, and I'm not anti come and see, but we have to combine come and see with go and get, go and tell. So mm -hmm. what we're finding is the youth groups that are thriving are missional. They're focused on the Great Commission as the greatest cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, I dare to share, we don't call it the Great Commission. We call it the cause. It's the great cause of Christ to go and make disciples. And what, what I find is when teens view the gospel as the greatest cause, then they get excited. Then they come to youth group. Then they want to grow and they want to go and reach their campuses yeah. and friends. And so uh, I think if we really want to get them to grow, we got to get them to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what Dare to Share does. We train, equip, and mobilize yeah. teenagers and youth leaders how to build a go mentality and to carry it out. Yeah, one of the things you hear is that uh, you see a lot of teenagers, the people are saying that there's no hope, uh, there's no purpose. Uh, they're looking at iPads or, or whatever they're looking at uh, to get on the internet, and they're living vicariously through some social influencer, and uh, mm -hmm. they're living lives of isolation, not lives of purpose. Uh, how do you how do you break through all that? And 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 uh, I mean, with Dare to Share, you're not a youth group; you're a ministry to youth groups. Uh, yeah. how, how do you break through all that and 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 get them energized? So, <clears throat> Kara Powell, Dr. Kara Powell, came out with a book called uh, "It's Like the Three Biggest uh, Questions a Teenager Asks," and it's identity, belonging, and purpose. So, you mm -hmm. know, identity: Who am I? Belonging: Where do I belong? Purpose: Why am I here? Well, the gospel answers the question to all that identity you're a child of god mm -hmm. you've been adopted into the family of god belonging you're part of a family a family of god yeah. and purpose go and make disciples and uh, so i think we need to reposition christianity from a meeting to a mission you know and the gospel is not just a ticket to heaven it's yeah. it's it's also a ticket to knowing who you are as you're talking to youth leaders what are their biggest obstacle obstacles to uh to bridging that gap, first of all, to a teenager and yeah. getting that teenager to say, yeah, I believe that. I mean, how do they emphasize with a teenager when, and in your case, you're 56 years old. How do you emphasize with yeah. a teenager who's facing uh, issues that you never faced as a, as a young person? Yeah, well, they, I, I would say every teen, we, they struggle with the same kind, basic kinds of things that we struggle with when we were teens, but social media exasperates all that, just yeah. accelerates all that, you know? And, you know, it, it's it's a bigger struggle because it's everywhere and they can't get away from it. Um, so what do, you, what do you do? You have a bigger offense. You got, you got to play the best defense is a good offense, right? And I think we need to go hard at, at really showing how the gospel uh, solves identity, belonging, and purpose. And we need to give these kids mis missionized and they heal along the way. So mm -hmm. I had one girl at a – we do a summer camp called Lead the Cause. It's like a student leader camp. And she came to me, she goes, you know, every camp I go to is all about me, my hurts, my needs. She goes, this is the first one where, yeah, you talk a little bit about that, but you really talk about Christ and the cause. And she goes, you know, keep lo looking up to who Jesus is and looking out to that mission in the process. I feel like I've been healed. Wow. And so I really think the transformation comes when we take our eyes off ourselves 
and look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We fix our eyes on him. And then we look at the fields that are ripe for harvest. Mm -hmm. And in the process, our hearts are transformed. And so I think we need a new mentality in youth ministry. We need to, we need to totally rebuild youth ministry. Um, and how do we do that? We go back to the book of Acts. It's a radical new paradigm that's 2,000 years old. It's mobilizing our kids for the gospel. It's, it's pouring into making disciples who make disciples. And you can have fun and games along the way and, you know, do camp and all the great stuff, you know, play dodgeball. All that's great. But we got to make room for what matters. And what matters is the mission, not entertaining kids, yeah. but mobilizing them. Then they'll come back to youth group because they got a purpose and a mission and belonging and identity. Yeah. Is there is their greatest fear when they when they uh, when you see the light go on in their in their head? Is their greatest fear been what do my friends think? Am I going to get canceled? Am I going to look like a fool on on social media? Oh, yeah. uh, what's their greatest fear to to make that that light click on in their brain in their heart? Yeah, all that and, and yeah, I mean all that stuff. I mean you. You give a kid a choice between going to the Amazon and building a mud hut for the poor <laughs> while fighting off pythons or going to their school cafeteria, their public school cafeteria, and sharing Christ with a group of their friends. They'll choose the pythons because mm -hmm. they'd rather literally get risk getting choked by a real python than getting choked out of their social circle. So that is a huge fear. But when kids bridge that gap and do that, what, what, they re what it does is it deepens their faith because they're scared to death. It makes them mm -hmm. dependent on the Holy Spirit. They see that usually their friends don't all reject them. Some of them are very open. Matter of fact, I think teenagers today are more open than ever to talk about spiritual stuff. And when they get to lead of one of those friends of Christ, it's a game changer. Yeah. It is a game changer. So I think, hey, we face those fears and we lean in. To, we have somebody inside of us called the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? Now, I want to give you something to think about, Bob. Jesus was a youth leader. So <laughs> yeah. if, let me let me make let me make my case. Matthew 17, 24 through 27, Peter and Jesus and the disciples go into Capernaum, but only Peter and Jesus pay the temple tax. Yeah. If you cross from that with Exodus chapter 30, verse 14, the temple tax was only for those 20 years old and older. So all the disciples are there, but only Peter and Jesus pay. If I'm reading that right, he was a Jesus was a youth leader with one adult sponsor, <laughs> one rotten kid named Judas, and no budget. And with that youth group, he changed the world. Yeah. Now, we have an advantage over Jesus. That sounds heretical. But in our youth ministry strategy, his disciples at the time didn't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Our students yeah. that have put their faith in Christ do. The Holy Spirit was with the early disciples, but not in them. Not in them. And from Acts 2 on, they, it was he was in them. Right. So we can change the world, shake our cities with a youth group of 12, just like Jesus what what are your tools? What how are you how are you reaching them? How are you reaching youth leaders? And uh, yep. what what's what's the, the the tactical side of that? So two two main things we have uh, catalytic events. So uh, every November we do Dare to Share Live, which is a free seven hour training on a Saturday where students are inspired, equipped, and mobilized to share the gospel. It's fun. Uh, it's interactive, but with last November, we had 1,300 churches participate across the nation, urban, suburban, rural, uh, Southern Baptist to Pentecostal, you know, and it's a free event. Uh, we also have a uh, Life in Six Words app that's free on the App Store that it's in 12 different languages. If you can swipe and read, you can share the gospel. And we, as of now, we have about 75 pieces of free curriculum on our website, daretoshare.org. And I... I encourage parents, grandparents, youth leaders, anybody that's associated with a teenager is a youth leader, a leader of youth. Mm -hmm. Go to dare to share the number two, dare to share.org. Download this free curriculum. Take your teens through it. Mobilize them with the gospel. Go to the app store. Download life in six words. Go to dare to share live.org. Be a part. Yeah, you got to teach them how, how to evangelize. Exactly. So the illustration I use, if I take a sponge with milk, and I pour the milk in that sponge and I don't wring it out, it rots. Uh, it spoils. We have a lot of discipleship strategies just pouring milk. Mm -hmm. And what happens if we don't wring that out to others through evangelism and discipleship, we rot. And I think our whole strategy for discipleship is two believers that have been saved for 20 years, meeting every week for an hour to remind themselves of stuff they should already know and should already be doing. That's not biblical discipleship. 
Biblical discipleship is we make disciples that make disciples. We, make disciples. we get the word in and we get we put the pour the word out. Yeah. What kind of what kind of reports are you getting back from the field now? I mean, and, and oh man, thirty years. I mean, what what are you seeing? What are you seeing as results? We're seeing I, revival in pockets. I mean, we really are. Mm -hmm. I, we want it to be a sweeping revival, um, but we're starting to really see teenagers unleash. I mean, just this last weekend in Mobile. I mean, literally. Teens running up to me, engaging the gospel with their friends, kids that have just put their faith in Christ, sharing the gospel for the first time that day. They trusted Christ the night before, or sharing Christ the next day with their friends. Students in gospel conversations, I mean, adult youth leaders getting convicted that they're not sharing Christ with their own neighbors and friends. I mean, you get this in the middle. What, you read the book of Acts, what happens? The Holy Spirit in Acts 2, how does he appear? He appears on a, as a tongue. Mm-hmm on fire, which is a really weird on way fire, to yeah. appear, but he sets their tongues on fire with the gospel. I think we get twisted mm -hmm. around that passage and we miss the point. The first sign of the indwelling Holy Spirit is our tongues are set on fire for Jesus Christ. Yeah. What, what continues to give you not only hope that it's going to change, but the, the, the knowing that it's going to change and the joy of seeing it change? Well, I, I think this generation is ready, ready for a mission and ready for a vision. I mm -hmm. think the gospel is good news, so we have to explain it as good news. And I think once they're called nuns, N-O-N-E-S, mm -hmm. they don't have any religion. Once they hear the real gospel, the yeah. truth that God loves them, he cares about them, sin screwed mm -hmm. everything up, religion doesn't work and closing the gap, but Jesus paid the price mm -hmm. on the cross because he loves them that much and that he rose from the dead. It's good news. And, you know, all you have to do is put your faith in him. Like my mom with that cigarette, you know, you may not, all, all I got to do is trust him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then Jesus does that work of transformation in their souls. So I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful. Very hopeful. Okay. You're talking to a, a lot of teenagers that are going to go out and evangelize. What, what kind of mistakes do you see them? I mean, they, they got enthusiasm. They've got uh, oh, yeah. youth on their side. Uh, you, you see him making any rookie mistakes out there? Oh, yeah. Well, one rookie mistake is they sometimes they bring it up too quick. It's hot in here. It's hot in hell, too. Let me tell you about Jesus. You know, just <laughs> Enthusiasm. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're excited. The other is this mentality that, oh, I'll just live the gospel out. Um, you know, there's that old quote, preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. I hate that quote. Yeah. Uh, I change it to preach the gospel. It's necessary. Use words. Use words. And of course, we want to live it, but we also got to give it. So mm -hmm. I think that balance between rel relentless and relational, you know, uh, we got to help teenagers find. But that's our job as, as adults and, and, you know, parents and grandparents and youth leaders. We coach them. We help mm -hmm. them. As Greg said, God does his best work against a dark background. It's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. So we'd appreciate your financial support. I'm Bob Placey, thanks for joining me. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gift so we can continue to produce more programs.